I played through Pokemon Legends Arceus as Ango. Why? Because in the main story, we are the second trainer Arceus brings back from the future. Ingo was the first, and I couldn't help but wonder if bringing us back was really necessary. Couldn't Ingo just protect his Hui himself? After all, he was the head of the endgame battle area in Generation 5, making him one of the most experienced trainers Arceus could have snagged. I'm sure he could handle a couple of Super Saiyan Pokemon and a merchant who'd sold his soul to Giratina, right? Right? It's time to find out. Unlike the real Ingo, who spawned in somewhere else in Hisui, our journey begins at Prelude Beach and Jubilee Village, whose residents are very suspicious of outsiders even though they themselves are outsiders to Hisui. I sure hope Ingo had an easier time fitting in with the Pro Clan. If we were given the choice of a starter Pokemon, I think the obvious option would be Oshawott, since it's the only starter from the Unova region. And even though we can win against Volo with an Oshawott, Ingo doesn't actually get an Oshawott. Since he is also from the future, Ingo would have no problem approaching and catching all sorts of Pokemon. Pokemon, but given his affinity for battle, he wouldn't be too focused on trying to catch them all or anything like that. Maybe Arceus gave him a different directive, or just didn't bother telling Ingo what to do, like he tells us every 5 minutes. Hey trainer, in case you forgot, seek out all Pokemon! I wonder if I should remind people to subscribe that frequently too. Anywho, before completing the tutorial section of the game, I decided to change up Ingo's look. Since the Pearl Clan outfit isn't available until the end of the game for some reason, I had to settle with an outfit that sort of resembles Ingo's, and since most of his clothing is dark blue, I thought I I'd go with something of a similar shade. Indigo! Sounds a lot like Ingo and looks close enough so that'll do. We also need to get a different haircut to look more like Ingo. This messy ponytail look seems to be the best fit since it can sort of mimic Ingo's sideburns. And done! I can't tell if this looks more like Ingo or a generic cutesy anime girl. <laughs> There are two Pokemon from Ingo's team that I can catch in the Obsidian Fieldlands, and I definitely cut them out of order since I noticed a random Abra on my way towards the Machops. These things are pretty tricky to catch since they startle easily and teleport around a bit, but I got really lucky and caught this Abra on my first throw. Although if you are struggling to catch them, the trick is to stand right behind the Pokeball and if they do break out, you have enough time to throw another right at their back. After acquiring an Abra, I teleported myself near Ouroboro Tunnel with a Bidoof's hidden move Rock Smash or something like that, and then strolled right into the den of Machops. And the Hapini. I really need to get my priorities straight. Having captured both Pokemon, I swapped out my team to fit Ingo's and continued with the main story. Starting with that Alpha Cricketune, which knows Aerial Ace. Yeah, I, I failed this battle. Several times. But you know what? Ingo joined the Pearl Clan. He wouldn't be involved in the dealings with the Diamond Clan and their random Cricketune issues. So I cheesed this fight with several Zubat and carried on like nothing ever happened. After all, the real trouble in the Obsidian Field Lands isn't a random Alpha Cricketune, but a very angry Cleavor. I could see Ingo standing out as a powerful trainer and being sent over to potentially deal with this problem himself. Of course, that would mean he'd have to fight Cleavor's Warden first, but not with an Abra. The little Gumi doesn't do much damage when I swapped out to Machop, and then Bullet Punch gave me the opportunity to attack twice, sealing my victory with a strong style Rock Smash. I bet that's a move Leon would like to teach his Pokemon. Next, Ingo would have to fight Irida to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that he's strong enough to face Cleavor, with the right Pokemon in the lead this time. Machop has a nice type advantage against against Glaceon and is able to get two attacks again thanks to that bullet punch. I doubt this strategy is going to work three battles in a row, but let's try it against Cleaver anyways. Well, uh, looks like bullet punch won't let us attack twice this time. And of course, Cleaver knows a flying type move. Time to bail. Abra, teleport! Uh oh. Ingo, teleport! Leon, let me out! That test of strength you made me take wasn't good enough! Alright, I guess I just have to punch Cleaver myself, huh? So as it turns out, Ingo's Obsidian Fieldlands team can't do anything against Cleaver. And I didn't want to cheese another fight with a Zubat, so I had to think outside the box. You see, in the post game, you can battle Ingo, and that's the main team I wanted to use during this run. But as it turns out, Ingo has two teams. One of them has his regular I am Warden Ingo Pokemon, and the other has three Alphas, which also happen to be noble Pokemon. And look, Cleavor is one of them. But to get Cleavor, you have to evolve a Scyther. So this win was totally legal. Now if only I had the foresight to bring Scyther into that Cricketune battle. Let's just do some Photoshop. See, it's, it's a Scyther. Yes, my Scyther looks like a bat, but that's okay. He just likes to cosplay. Having quelled Cleavor, the Pearl Clan will dispatch Ingo to help out with another noble Pokemon that's been acting out of line, Ursaluna. But before springing back into action, it's time to add another Pokemon to our team, Tangela. And of course, we have another practice round with Volo. Unlike the time I battled him as Kamado, I was prepared for that Draining Kiss Togepi. First, I had Tangela poison it, and then I hit it with Acid Spray to reduce its defenses. And after it healed itself up with my health, Tangela finished it off with two Acid Sprays in a row. See, I came prepared this time. 
time? I was not prepared this time. You might be wondering, uh, what happened to Abra and Scyther? I was in a hurry to record this run because I'm taking a trip to Europe this summer. And in fact, I'm there right now. Hi. And so the beginning of this run was very sloppy. I wasn't sure what team to use for Ingo. There was his main endgame team, his early game battle team, and his noble Pokemon team. Typically, I keep the trainer's teams matched to their in-game teams. So Ingo was supposed to only have Machop in the first area and could have Tangela on the team for this one. Since Machop wasn't able to solo carry me against the Cricketune or Cleavor, I needed to bring in Scyther as a last ditch effort. Abra doesn't join Ingo's team until after we defeat him in the Coronet Highlands. So when I arrived in the Crimson Mirelands, I thought it would be best to bench Abra and Scyther for the time being. I hadn't set clear rules for myself in terms of the team composition and was trying to rush getting all the footage, so the early game was very sloppy. As the Bulgarian saying goes, rushed work brings shame to its master. And in my case, rushing the recording really messed up the consistency of the team compositions. For that, I am sorry, and I'll take my time in the future. Now, back to the video. Before allowing us to help, Calabi gives us a side quest to defeat some thieves and return a stolen wall fragment to the Selassion ruins. Thankfully, we only have to fight one thief, Coin, who has one Pokemon, Toxic Rogue. A champ's bullet punches barely tickled this frog, and even a strong style tackle was useless. Tangela was out next, but having no useful moves and a strong weakness to poison type attacks meant that this poor Nodo monster did not stand a chance. I experimented with a couple of different movesets, but the outcome was always the same. Heads she wins, tails I lose. I was once again stuck. And at this point, I just threw out the idea of keeping Ingo's team story based and decided to just build his endgame team. I had no choice but to add Abra back on the team and evolve it into a Kadabra so that it can finally use a move other than teleport. With a psychic type on the team, winning against Coin was a breeze. You know what wasn't a breeze? Trying to set up a second camp in the Mirelands. Why? Because I had to take down three Stunky at once. Machop got to move twice thanks to Bullet Punch, but couldn't do enough damage to knock out a single Stunky, and then they just threw a bunch of poison at it. Tangela barely lived long enough to finish off the Stunky that Machab had attacked, and Kadabra couldn't do anything since these things are also dark type, so none of our moves would have any effect. <sighs> if I was Arceus, I would definitely start thinking about getting some other trainer from the future to help us save Hisui, because uh, this battle expert guy has been pretty useless so far. Since it's impossible to set up the second camp at the moment, Ingo heads over to Kalaba and tries to take on Ursaluna. To be honest, my hopes were not too high. After giving us the baby doll eye, Machop could once again barely tickle the giant bear, but at least he managed to reduce his defense that a bit with Rock Smash, and then he got one shot, just like when going up against the previous Noble. Thankfully, I have Tangela now, so I can poison the bear and leech off its health little by little. By the time Kadabra comes out, the battle is as good as won. Oh, thank god goodness. Had I gotten stuck on a 6th major battle in a row, I think I would've just quit this run entirely, but I suppose there's hope for Ingo yet. Knowing that we'll be up against a grass type noble Pokemon next, I decided to pay Zisu a visit to teach my Pokemon some more useful moves. Fire Punch will be way better to know than Tackle. With that slight moveset adjustment complete, it's time to rescue Arezu and square up against Lilligant. But Lilligant didn't want to square up, instead she just kept dancing around, using ground pounds and energy pulses. I was starting to worry that I wouldn't be able to enter the battle phase since I had its Super Saiyan health down to almost 25%, but thankfully it messed up the landing on one of its jumps and I could finally challenge it to a fight. I guess she really didn't want to get fire punched by that Machop there. Also, whoops, I'm definitely under leveled. This is what I get for trying to rush and literally go from boss battle to boss battle. Thankfully, Kadabra can attack twice and has a super effective move, so Ingo is able to quell another noble. Now that my faith in Ingo is restored, it is time to level up her team a bit by fighting off all the right horn near the Diamond Clan settlement. I sure hope this doesn't cause any trouble with the Time Folk. And I can also finally evolve Machop, so hopefully he won't be getting one shot by everything. <laughs> I almost forgot what game this was, he's definitely gonna get one shot by something again. Our next area to explore is the Kobold Coastlands, a land without a noble, well at least not for the Poro Clan, which makes me wonder if Ingo was another candidate to become a warden in this region. If he'd been around in the Poro Clan for a short period of time, perhaps he would have been considered. But seeing as Irida only mentions herself and Paulina for this role, and this might suggest that Ingo has been in the Hisui region for quite some time, uh, definitely several years. Anyways, we fire punch Irida's Glacian and continue with our quest. Iskan asks us to capture da 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 da
We also set up the second camp in the coastlands, since we only have to fight one Pokemon this time. And then, after gaining Basque Legion's trust, we make our way to Fire Spit Island and check for the suspicious figures, which turn out to be the Misfortune Sisters. And this time, we have to fight all three of them, starting with Clover and her poor Obama Snow. That poor, poor Obama Snow. Next is Coin, who's back for a rematch, the results of which have not changed. And finally, Charm, who uses the Pokemon we farmed for experience in her leading slot, and a Gengar, who is very weak to our psychic type moves. While they were deliberating on whether or not the spam revives in order to try and win against me, the Growlithe in training arrives on the island, evolves, and uses Intimidate to scare away the thieves. I too am intimidated, but uh, I don't get the option to run. Instead, I face the Arcanine head on and try to figure out what I need to do to get it to battle me. You think that by my third run of this game, I'd know the ins and outs of how these encounters work? But the first time I played it was while I was recovering from COVID, and the second time I was trying to moderate a rowdy YouTube chat. You know who you are. So I really wasn't paying that much attention. But this time, even though I was rushing to record the run, I wanted to do things right, right enough. So I paid attention and noticed that Arcanine has a very specific set of attacks. First, it will rush at you, then it will jump. After a while, it's gonna start charging up an attack, which I thought I just needed to dodge. But nope, in order to enter battle mode, I need to hit it with five bombs while it's charging up. Can't believe it took me so long to realize, but hey, better late than never. Machoke was able to use an agile bullet punch to gain a second turn and then a strong style rock smash to deal major damage. And then instead of being smart, I decided to flex and send out Tangela, who finished off the fight with a strong style absorb. With Fire Island saved and a new noble to watch over the Kobold Coastlands for the Pearl Clan, it was time for me to take my leave. Except I had to take the very very slow scenic route because I needed a space-time distortion to appear. You see, out of the six Pokemon on Ingo's final team, five of them can appear in at least two areas in the game, but the Magnemite line can only appear in this distortions on the Kobold Coastlands. I was also a bit surprised to find out that Alakazam also appear in those distortions, even though the Abraline is typically unavailable in this area. This really made me wonder if Ingo was brought into Hisui through the Kobold Coastlands. It's basically the only other prime beach area to drop a human in in the entire region. He could have caught a Machop and a Tangela near the beach, and Kadabra and Magnemite from an eventual distortion that he ran into. That could also explain the random Basque Legion he has on his noble Pokemon team. Perhaps Ingo came back to this area often to try and find clues about his past, and he'd definitely need a Basque Legion to explore the waters in this area. And the more time he spent here, the more likely he is to run into a distortion and get himself a Kadabra and a Magnemite. That's my two cents on where I think Ingo came from, but do let me know what your thoughts on the topic are in the comments below. While running around the distortion, I also happened to find a Link Cable, and since Kadabra has been a very reliable Pokemon so far, I decided to use this item and evolve it instead of Machoke. Also, I still felt the vague need to keep Ingo's team some somewhat on par with his in-game events, and since he doesn't have a Machamp until after we get to use Sneasler, I wanted to keep Machoke unevolved. Nearly halfway through the game, and we finally get to meet the man himself. Our outfit doesn't look too far off from the real thing, eh? To proceed with the story, we need to fight Adaman next, because Melly refuses to acknowledge the Pearl Clan Warden as one who is capable enough to help with their noble Pokemon. And just as I was about to challenge Adaman, I noticed something was off with Melly. Why is there a little child standing right next to him? Turns out she has a quest for me where I was supposed to show her a magic card, but since I've been ignoring all the side quests, she was still standing there and made it look like she was trying to talk to Melly and show his softer side. <laughs> yeah, right. Time to fight Adaman. I figured it's best to take care of the weaker sidekick Pokemon first, that way it can't torment me with random status effects. But Adaman goes and one-shots Machoke. I wasn't worried at all since Tangela could easily finish off the battle with one poison type move. Having been approved to help out the Diamond Clan, I decided to go back to Zisu and prepare my team a bit more. It was about time Alakazam expanded its move coverage and also finally get a formal introduction to Ingo. He guided me through the Wayward Cave while somehow recalling memories of his past life, his signature Pokemon Chandelure, and his brother slash twin slash I have no idea what kind of relationship they have but uh, Emmett. At the end of our little excursion, Ingo admits that he does not know what his true purpose is, which tells me that this is the main mistake Arceus made when bringing him to the past, and also why we have the Arc Phone to constantly remind us what we're supposed to do. Although, I do have a different goal in mind, Arceus, so uh, not today. And for defying Arceus, I must battle Melly. He only uses Kuntank, but I struggled to defeat the three of its baby forms, so I have to play it smart here. Using Bullet Punch, Machoke attacks twice, and using Rock Smash, we reduce the tank's defenses. Tangela is out next, and finally has a move it can use on this enemy. Since it wasn't strong enough, I needed to send out one more Pokemon. Alakazam is the obvious choice here, but because I forgot that Zisu only enables a Pokemon to learn a move and doesn't 
actually put it in their active move pool, Alakazam is still stuck with only psychic type attacks and wouldn't be able to do anything in this battle. It felt a bit cheap using 3 Pokemon to win one fight, but Ingo's gotta do what Ingo's gotta do. This includes talking to Volo who clearly has met Ingo in the past. After a short conversation, it became clear to me that even though Ingo said he didn't know what his purpose was, he had decided to use his skills in battle to protect the people of this region. And he said that right to the face of the guy he'll have to defeat to protect those very people. Having set up the second camp in the Highlands, I decided it was time to complete Ingo's team before fighting Ingo. In my Kamado run, I had discovered that you can use Wordier to climb up this cliff face near the exit of the stone quarry, and from there you could run right up to the electrode seat, which is completely empty and melee-less until you win against Ingo. The nice thing is that the last two Pokemon I need can both spawn in the ruined town near Electrode, so I quickly caught a Gligar in a nose pass and grabbed another Link cord from the distortion forming nearby. As a side note, you'd think a Pokemon with a giant nose would gravitate towards things that smell nice, like berries or salt, but this guy decided to just pass on every single snack I threw his way. Having completed Ingo's team, it was time for me to battle Ingo and unlock Sneasler. What I thought was interesting is that once we got Sneasler, Ingo just dips out and goes back to Jubilife Village. Does this mean I should go back to Jubilife Village now? Out of pure curiosity, and also the desire to rid myself of those Sonic shoes I had bought from the Ginkgo Guild for way too much money, I returned to Jubilife. To my surprise, Ingo was nowhere to be found. Well, at least I got better looking shoes. Now back to the Highlands I go. Since I still needed to evolve my Gligar, I called up that Sneasler and climbed up to the Alpha Gligar spawning ground, then beat up and caught every Gligar I could until one of them dropped a Razor Fang needed to evolve this Pokemon. Melly was back at his seat and ready for a rematch, this time sending out three Pokemon at once, and they get speed priority, so poor Machoke goes down before getting to do anything. For some reason, I thought that sending out Tangela was a good idea, but it also got one shot before it could do anything. Finally, a Pokemon that could actually get an attack in! Since I didn't want to be triple teamed again, I decided to go after the weaker Pokemon first, starting with Scorpy. Zubat put me to sleep, but thankfully that doesn't stop me from attacking in this game, so now it's back to a fair one on one battle. Except Melly decides to be funny and uses an agile style attack to get two moves, and then finished off Gliscor with a strong style Night Slash. I guess that strong style cost him some movement speed because Magneton could attack twice, allowing it to knock out the Skun Tank with ease. With Melly out of the way, Electrode came out to play. I did try to dodge the homing Electro Balls and learned that they simply keep following you until Electrode explodes, and at that point, you can even throw more bombs at it or go into battle. I go into battle. Rip my choke. Even though we are under level, the Tangela is able to do some major damage and thank a Thunder, allowing it to finish off the Glow Ball. There was one more thing to do before leaving the Highlands. Since about half of Ingo's team requires you to be in this specific map to evolve, I figured now is the best time to do it, as opposed to waiting until the final stages of the game where we do come back here. Might as well evolve Tangela and Machoke now too, right? Now that the team is fully evolved, it was also time to complete their movesets so they would match that of Ingo's in-game team. Oh yeah, and also actually change their movesets so that Alakazam isn't stuck with a quad psychic move pool. Since Ingo Ingo was finally back at the village, I decided to pay him a visit. Looks like he changed his mind yet again. Instead of working as a warden or trying to protect Hisui, he has decided to spread the joys of Pokemon battles to the trainers of Hisui. I suppose we were the bad influence that reminded him how fun battles are, but it's better than not really having a goal or purpose to work towards. With this new position, Ingo can call upon other trainers to do mock battles with us, so I figured why not. The first opponent was Zisu, the lady who helps my Pokemon learn the moves they need to so they don't suck in battles. She starts out with an Ape Bomb and finally my champ doesn't get one shot at the start. And this lets me use an Agile style Bullet Punch and then a Draining Punch to finish off the Monkey and also restore some health. Next up is a Luxray whom I tickle with a Bullet Punch and then Drain Punch in hopes of getting enough HP to survive an attack. And not enough Hopium. Probo Pass is out next since it knows Earth Power. Oh wow, she has a Zoroark. Those are pretty rare. Once again, I have nothing good to attack it with and I'm pretty underleveled, but hey, that did some decent damage. I decided to risk it with a strong style Flash Cannon and it paid off. This left Zisu with just a Haunch Crow, which did not hesitate to obliterate poor Magnezone. I sent out Tangrowth next and finished off the fight with an Ancient Power. Not gonna lie, Zisu's team seems pretty cool. The only other two trainers Ingo could call for now were Wenton and Bren, both of which used the two variants of Gastrodon, the male and female evolution of Burmy, and an Evolution. What surprised me the most was that in these battles, Bren had a Sylveon. I guess that's what the developers thought was a good opposite to Jolteon? One spiky, the other one smooth, is that? I don't understand. Anyways, with our training complete, it was time to tackle the Alabaster Ice 
Clans, home of the Pearl Clan. Their first challenge there is to face off against Gyrek, who looks like he'd rather be doing squats, which reminded me to get on my chair and do some squats as well. One, two, three, oh that's enough. The hardest thing about this battle against two ice type Pokemon was the squats I just did. And the most eventful thing was this screenshot I got of Ingo with cat ears. Yeah, not, not much happened. Since doing squats wasn't enough, I also had to go for a jog to catch up to Sabi of the Diamond Clan. This, this this run is just making me fit. Anyways, after catching up to Sabi, I had to battle her and her three Titanic Pokemon. They didn't even let Machamp have a turn. I thought maybe Probopass would be bulky enough, but it was too slow, got paralyzed, and also went down in an instant. Somehow, Gliscor got the chance to attack and I used this opportunity to take care of the Electrovire first so that it couldn't paralyze any more of my team. Both of Sabi's remaining Pokemon decided to, to attack me with an Agile style move, allowing them to get a second round of attacks in and wiping out poor old Gliscor. Alakazam was out next, using Psychic to take out the Magmortar before getting stomped out by Rhyperior. With one enemy left, it was time to get in the zone, the Magna Zone, and use an Agile style Flash Cannon then finish it off with a second one. Having defeated Sabi, there was one more battle to go and only two Pokemon left on my team. I was starting to worry if I maybe needed to do some more training. Thankfully, Magnazone tanked a hurricane, paralyzed the Braviary, and then struck it with thunder to secure our victory. With the ability to glide, Ingo secured the ice needed to calm down Avalug, then made his way up to the arena. Something I like about the Avalug fight is that it is rather easy to figure out when I can enter a battle, since it literally fires off a powerful ice beam before having to stop and take a breath. <sighs> Despite this thing being Dynamaxed, it doesn't seem to have any extra HP, so much champ can easily both through one of its attacks, set up a bullet punch, and finish it off with a strong style draining punch. And since I know the battle's about to be over, I can run right up to the ledge and start throwing more bombs. With all the nobles quelled, it is time to team up with Irida and go collect the parts needed to create a red chain. Gudra is quite the powerful guardian, mainly thanks to its shelter move, which not only boosts its defense stat, but also raises its evasion. Yuxi is guarded by a Zoroar which hits quite hard but isn't bulky enough to take on a team of six, and the spiky fish proved to be the weakest of the three. Now that we've got ourselves a red chain, it's time to go share our plan with Team Galactic, but by the looks of it, the commander and the strongest trainers have left for Mount Coronet to face off the impending threat. And this is where I noticed an inconsistency in the game. Zisu and the other two trainers from the training rounds were supposed to be the ones out with Kamado, but you could still have Ingo call them over for a training session. See? Zisu, Wenton, and Bren are all here. But but at the same time, I can just battle them back at the village. Weird. Anyways, on our way back towards the temple, Benny reveals to us that he is a ninja and challenges us to a battle so that we won't get in Kamado's way. His lead Pokemon instantly puts Machamp to sleep, and when he dozes off, Benny shows no mercy and knocks it out with an extra sensory. Alakazam is my only Pokemon with a super effective move here, so it's out next, setting up an agile calm mind, then taking out Miss Magius with a Shadow Ball. Gardevoir is out next, but couldn't knock us out. However, the Sneasler quickly finishes us off with a Dire Claw. Gliscor comes in with an Earth Power, which forces Benny to use up his one-time healing item on the Sneasler. I couldn't get a speed boost with the Agile style move, so I just kept attacking with Earth Power until it went down. Benny's Gallade wasn't too happy with me. I decided to play it safe and paralyze it, but as it turns out, his Gallade knows Drain Punch. Since they couldn't gain a second turn with Agile moves, I figured it was time to risk it for the Biscuit and use a strong style move instead. I managed to land a critical hit, defeating the Mochi Man, and winning food for a life! If only I can prevent the world from being destroyed. Kamado wanted to get that free food for life as well, so he also challenged me to a battle. I was hoping he'd start with Golem, but instead Bravier was first and one-shot my Machamp. Having dealt with his bird fairly recently, I remembered that I could just one-shot it with a Thunder. Snorlax could be a problem with its special bulk and high attack, since Gliscor is my only other physical attacker, it was out next. His Giga Impacts hit hard, while our X Scissors were barely cutting down its health. And of course, uh, this is where Kamado decides to heal. Probopass has some physical moves, so I guess that's who's next. Once again, I'm barely doing any damage, and the Snorlax shed its paralysis too. Poor Probo got stomped away with a strong style horsepower. Tangrowth was fast enough to get two moves in, allowing us to finally finish off Snorlax. Kamado sent out Golem next, but we all know that this thing is pretty useless, leaving the commander with just Clefable, who finished off Tangrowth. And what a shame that was, because we knew a poison type move that could have easily won us the battle right there. But alas, instead I'll have to set up a combine with Alakazam, and uh oh, this thing I was draining. 
Lightning Kiss. Thankfully, it didn't restore enough health to poke through a second Psychic, allowing Ingo to win this battle. Just barely, but still a win. That free food for life is all mine now, Kamado. At the D Temple, we get to meet the god of the Pearl Clan, Palkia. For some reason, I completely forgot that I had to catch this one, so in my first attempt, I went on the offensive. My champ got blown away, but Alakazam could set up a Calm Mind and hit Palkia with a powerful Dazzling Gleam, and thanks to our setup, it could also tank through a Spatial Rend and become the new deity of the Pearl Clan. I was confused. Then Irida reminded me that Palkia wanted to be captured, so I went back into the same thing, but instead of attacking a second time, I threw an Ultra Ball and caught the Legendary. Now Dialga, that's the one we're supposed to defeat in battle. In an unfortunate turn of events, I got scolded by Kogita several times because I didn't want to add Palkia on my team. After all, I wanted to stick to Ingo's actual team for the upcoming fight, but since she wouldn't budge, I took out Probopass to make room for Palkia, because they both start with a P, that's it. And then I immediately swapped them back once I got to the Coronet Highlands, but then Kamado wouldn't let me through unless I had Palkia on my team. Here I thought I could be funny, but it looks like the developers really said you gotta have that legendary here for this one, also that you can throw out its Pokeball and have it use Protect in the cutscene so you don't die, Mr. Games, don't die. During the battle with Dialga, I was starting to get worried that I wouldn't be able to enter into battle. My health was running low and I couldn't tell when I'd get it in a phase where I can throw the Pokeball at it to fight it. That was until I saw it charge up orbs just like that Arcanine. So I knew it was time for me to throw as many bombs as I could and then it was stunned. It's time to challenge it to a battle. I'm only mildly underleveled here, right? Knowing I had to go all out made it easy to attack with a close combat, which did quite a lot of damage. And since it had to recharge after using that roar of time, I was able to send in Gliscor and finish it off with ease. The Cricket Tune at the start of the game gave me more trouble than the final legendary. I know this is not the final legendary, but it's the final legendary. With the world finally saved, I am able to buy the Pearl Clan uniform and go collect all the remaining plates from the remaining legendaries. But since those are just capture quests, I also figured it was time to see who's the strongest Pearl Clan member and challenged Irida to a battle. She started off with a baby doll eye attack to lower my strength, which allowed Glaceon to bulk through a strong style close combat. Gliscor was out next, also getting the cutesy look, but her ace didn't have enough HP left to survive another move. Even though the other two evolutions were very much underleveled, they managed to finish off Gliscor together. Tangrove came out next to throw rocks to the Flareon, and since it was now all alone, Espeon didn't have enough power to defeat my Pokemon, leaving it wide open to an energy ball and securing my victory. Something that became painfully obvious to me during my time catching all the legendary Pokemon was that my team was very much underleveled. So I spent a lot of time in the Alabaster Icelands fighting off Pokemon and trying to catch a ton of Blissey or Chansey for large EXP gains. Even then, the leveling process felt extremely slow, so if you have any suggestions on how to quickly level up my team for future runs, please let me know. I don't want to be stuck here grinding for 3-4 to four hours just to fight Volo, but I did it and it's time to fight Volo, time to see if Farseus was worried for nothing, time to see if Ingo could protect Hisui, that's the title of the video I think, unless I changed it because nobody clicked on the other one. Since Spiritomb's only weakness is fairy type moves, I send out Alakazam first, set up a calm mind, and one shot the ghost with a strong style dazzling gleam. Sadly that leaves Alakazam wide open to an attack from Arcanine, but nothing to worry about since Gliscor is quite the useful Pokemon here. It was able to one shot with an earth power, tank a critical hit pedal dance from Roserade, and finish it off with a single aerial ace. Since we have speed priority, this also means Gliscor has enough time to use a strong style stone edge and end Togekiss's existence. Volo messes up by only using bullet punch on us once with Lucario and then trying to set up a bulk up, but he couldn't bulk through a strong style earth power. Things were looking good, with Volo being down to his last Pokemon while I still had 4 left. My champ is the next obvious choice since it knows Ice Punch, and this also gets Volo to use up his heal. He tries to be a little funny, but at the end, Gurchamp goes down. When Giratina arrives to the battle, we have to start fresh, so Magnezon gets sent out first instead of Machamp. The only problem with this is that Giratina knows Earth Boom. Power. Machamp returns to the field, attacking with a bullet punch and then an ice punch, but it couldn't do much against the dragon. And this is where things go south. With Probopass missing one of its attacks and Tangrowth being used as fodder while I revive Alakazam as a last hope, I set up a calm mind and then attack with a strong style Shadow Ball, which was enough to finish off Giratina the first time. Since Giratina gets a phase 2 and Alakazam is extremely squishy, this is where Ingo's battle ends. I tried going up against Volo several times, using different lead Pokemon, giving myself an extra reviver tool to compensate for Giratina's two phases, even buffing up my whole team with the effort value rocks. Nothing seemed to work. No matter what I did, Ingo could only go as far as getting Giratina to its second phase. And yes, I even tried bringing in Paul.
Palkia instead of Probal Pass. In the end, Ingo was powerless against Folo's legendary. Had Arceus left everything in the hands of Ingo, uh, the world would have been destroyed, no more food for life. Which is why it decided to bring us in as well, and also give us the explicit goal of seeking out all Pokemon. That way we could maybe bring something more useful to the battle. After all, every time Ingo faced Volo, Tangrowth, Magnezone, and Probopass were completely useless. And that's half his team right there. Ingo with his Ingo team can't do anything, he loses every single time. Seeing that even an endgame trainer wasn't powerful enough to stop Volo really makes me wonder if any of the other major trainers from Hisui could have stood a chance here. I might try to do one more of these, so do let me know who you think could possibly hold their ground against Folo in the comments below. I hope you enjoyed Ingo's journey, and if you did, be sure to subscribe and check out the Kamado run as well. Thanks for watching, have a happy summer, and I hope to see you in the next one.